Welcome everyone. I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Catherine Chung. I am a radiology resident at Stony Brook University Hospital. Today I have the pleasure of moderating and introducing you to Dr. Paul Fisher, who will be giving a talk on breast cancer screening and BIRADS. Dr. Fisher, uh, currently distinguished medical educator at the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University, is a retired associate professor of radiology and surgery who graduated from Georgetown University School of Medicine, attended his radiology residency at Harvard Medical School, Mount Auburn Hospital, then went on to do his fellowship at Yale New Haven Hospital and Yale Medical School. Appointed at Stony Brook University Hospital in 1999, he specializes in breast imaging. He is the former acting chairman of the Department of Radiology at Women's Hospital in Philadelphia and was the chief of breast imaging at Yale Medical College of Pennsylvania and Stony Brook University Hospital. He had been a longstanding member of the board of directors of Physicians for Social Responsibility, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. He has won the Teacher of the Year Award seven times in the past 16 years, as well as the prestigious Asclepius Teaching Award of Stony Brook School of Medicine the only radiologist to have won this prize to date. He has won many other awards, including the Broad Street Pump Award for the Physician for Social Responsibility, the Michael Mafton Outstanding Clinician Award, and the Ward Melville Heritage Partner Award. He is the former chairman of the Alumni Schools Committee of Princeton University, his undergraduate alma mater, and thus was responsible for directing hundreds of interviews of Princeton University applicants. Dr. Fisher currently completed a term on the RSNA Scientific Review Committee and as a question writer for the American College of Radiology's ACP, uh, CPI, sorry. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Suffolk County Medical Society. He's the ex-president of the Long Island Radi Radiologic Society and serves on its board of directors. Please welcome Dr. Paul Fisher. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chung. Uh, what a beautiful introduction. Uh, it's almost as if I wrote it myself, Dr. Chung. What do you think? <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Because <laughs> uh, I, I did. Uh, so, so uh, but thank you so much. Uh, okay, let me get started here. Uh, my talk today, let's see if I can get this to work is talking about breast cancer screening. It uh, sounds like an easy thing. It turns out to be somewhat of a challenging thing as almost all screenings are. So without further ado, let's jump into it. My objectives today are gonna really try to share with you how difficult screening is. If screening was easy, we'd be screening for lots of diseases. Why not look uh, for uh, lymphoma? Let's, uh, let's do some screening for ovarian cancer. Uh, there's a million things that would be theoretically nice to screen for, but we don't. And there's a reason for it. It is very, very difficult. And actually doing it with radiology is even harder. There are some screening procedures in regular medicine that seem to work pretty well, but uh, within radiology, it's an extremely limited set of uh, exams that actually can be used to screen a asymptomatic population that feels it's doing just fine without us. And that's because actually screening rarely works. It it's hard in most diseases, it's not appropriate to screen. Uh, with most modalities, it's inappropriate to screen. Turns out though, what I'm trying to the take home of this lecture is that mammography screening, despite all that actually does work. It saves a lot of lives, doesn't save them all. We're, we're working on making it even better, but uh, at the current time still saves a lot of lives and in the right context, in the right communities, in the right countries, uh, it, it is appropriate. Uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of mammo skeptics out there. So I'm trying to vaccinate you against those mammo skeptics that are out there. I'm gonna try to vaccinate you with my lecture, just like uh, people are getting vaccinated against COVID like this UNICEF worker. I wanna uh, vaccinate you against what I consider the misinformation or the misunderstandings about mammography. If you're taking this lecture to try to figure out how to read a mammogram, this is probably not the lecture for you. This is a lecture to describe to you why we work so hard doing the screening mammography. What's the 
underlying principles behind it. So screening, like I said, for most diseases is actually really, really, no doubt, really hard, which is again, why we don't really do it much. Because just to start off with, if you wanna have a successful disease screening program, you're gonna need three factors right off the bat which MAMO does and breast cancer does, but uh, most diseases don't have all these three. The first, the disease has to have a high prevalence. No matter how good a screening test you have, if you're screening for a rare disease, it's gonna just fail uh, on its own uh, petard. It's gonna be hoisted on its own petard if I wanna keep my metaphor right. So you have to have a disease that's, that's prevalent enough that when you screen, you'll be getting some true positives along with the inevitable false positives that happen with every screening program. Second thing, it has to be a good test, meaning the test you're using to screen has to have good sensitivity, good specificity, good predictive values, negative predictive values, and, and positive predictive values. And mammography has a good uh, sensitivity and specificity, but not great. So this is something where maybe we could do improvements in the future. And then finally, it has to be a disease in which finding the disease earlier actually leads to better clinical outcomes. In other words, patients do better when we find it early. That's not always true. The classic example where it's not true is lymphoma. We don't screen for lymphoma because it doesn't matter if we catch lymphoma early, middle, or late in its course. Uh, the outcomes are exactly the same no matter where you catch it. It just really depends on whether the lymphoma is going to be sensitive to your treatments such as your chemotherapy. So population-based medical screenings, our internal medicine colleagues here, yeah, they do a few things that we would consider as screenings. So one of them is uh, just the yearly physicals or like well baby physicals. Certainly, you know, you're all trained that how important that is. Actually, st when studies have looked, the benefit from yearly physicals in most cases is actually very, very limited, if, if any at all. So um, although our internal medicine doctors do this kind of medical screening with the yearly exams and for some patients, um, how, how useful it is without symptoms is, is actually open to some uh, conjecture. And if you're seeing your internist, you might get a blood pressure, EKGs, routine blood work, which yeah, is a form of a screening, a medical screening. And then of course, if you hit the right age groups or you're in the right populations, uh, colonoscopy or pap smears. We, the medicine people do know there are certain subpopulations that are at extra risk so for instance, if you've had a certain tumor, you might be screening later on with tumor markers or disease titers. But for radiology, population-based radiology screenings, we got a very short list of anything that is even close to working. One of them is mammography. I think it's the star of this list. Uh, the next one is, yeah, we do kind of screen for bone densities with, the, with bone density equipment, such as the DEXA scans. Uh, but that's not usually done for a general population. We don't ask everybody walking down the street to get their yearly DEXA. It's usually uh, patients who have had uh, fractures, insufficiency fractures, who have known osteoporosis or family history of osteoporosis or a known risk factor for osteoporosis. And then, of course, we virtual colonoscopy, that's a kind of a screening with a radiology uh, a twist to it, uh, similar to the, obviously, the colonoscopy that's done uh, by the um, by the GI specialists. And we do some subpopulations at risk screening. So for instance, the classic one is we do some limited lung cancer screening, but we don't screen everybody walking down a street or attending a football game. We screen only patients that be considered at high risk, for instance, heavy smokers. So I'm gonna tell you a few facts here that the MAMO deniers are going to often quote as good evidence that mammography doesn't work. And the twist here is that everything they say is true, but their analysis is incorrect. So here's a true statement. In 1980, 40,000 US women died of breast cancer. And in 2013, after, this is after we started screening mammography and it's kind of expensive and it's a lot of work and a lot of biopsies. After, after all that work, 40,000 died in 2013 too. So the skeptics will say, same mammography is not really doing, putting a dent in anything there. Another thing they'll say is only one woman in a thousand will have their lives saved by mammography. 
This is true, but it's not a knock against mammography, as I'll explain. And then mammography has not prevented a single case of breast cancer, but its radiation probably has induced some. True statement, that doesn't mean the screening mammography isn't worth its, uh, worth its weight though. And we'll get into that near the end of the lecture. Hopefully you'll understand those a little bit better near the end here. Let's open our window here. This is an international forum. I'd like to um, uh, welcome my, uh, my colleagues from around the world. Uh, I'm sharing with you my experience in my country, but uh, obviously we want to generalize when we, when we can generalize and be specific when we have to be specific. As I mentioned, there's about 200,000 new cases of breast cancer every year in the United States, about 40,000 deaths. If you look worldwide, it's actually about 2.3 million cases that are diagnosed with 685,000 deaths. So you can see maybe 10 times the number of cases and more than 10 times the number of deaths. But if you notice, a lot more people get diagnosed with breast cancer than die from it. So that means a fair number survive. And in fact, worldwide, there's estimated almost 8 million women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and actually are walking around okay. They're asymptomatic. They're they're uh, survivors or they're at least in remission, um, which means that they have uh, dodged that initial bullet. Of course, you can always get later recurrences, which is a worry, but it also means that the prevalence of breast, of breast cancer is actually very high. That's because we get a lot of cases, but also a lot of people then keep living, living, and technically they still might have a case of it. So it's actually been called the world's most prevalent cancer. Uh, other cancers may have higher incidences, but within the from, the from the world's point of view is prevalence, the number of actual cases present at a given time, it's probably the uh, gold medal winner. Another way it's probably a leader in the world is that it, uh, it, has, it produces the most Los Dalis. Uh, for, uh, it's a funny little expression that we use. What we're really talking about is uh, if a disease hits a population, uh, some of that population is not going to be able to go to work. They're not going to be able to function in their house. They're not going to be able to do anything but kind of suffer in a, ho in a hospital bed for a while. And breast cancer has been shown, uh, produces more of these lost disability adjusted life years. You know that you lose the effective ability to, of years of your life from all the treatments and the follow-ups and the recurrences and the... Um, and the dwindles that happen in, uh, in this horrible disease. So I'd like to start off with just a little pictorial here. Here's, here's a thousand women <laughs> in a group. So we have a thousand women that want to uh, go show up for their screening mammogram. Let's say they're age 40 or over. Uh, and this would be a population for the United States. We know from our statistics that in that thousand women, there are probably three hidden cancers that we could detect if we did the screening mammogram. So I'm going to show you three random cancers. Watch for a little sparkle and a little uh, woman there turning red. So there's one, there's one case of breast cancer, and there's a second case, and there's a third case there. So what screening mammography is saying, we can't really handle doing diagnostic work on a thousand women like this to try to find those three cancers. So what we want to do is we, we want to filter out some of the definitely normals so that we can then concentrate on the ones that have a higher chance. And hopefully when we filter it down, we're still keeping the uh, cancers in front of our line of sight. So here we are giving a screening mammogram to a thousand women. From those thousand women, we wanna pick 10% that we think have the highest chance of having a cancer. So here's that hundred women. And in that hundred women, what we're hoping is that we're still catching those three random cancers they were there originally in the thousand. So that's a diagnostic mammogram. We're now down to a hundred. We still can't biopsy a hundred women. That would be 10% of our population. So let's do 10% of this group to that will finally say th that they are suspicious enough after we've done extra views like mammography or ultrasound or MRI perhaps. We've narrowed it down now to 10 of them. So from the original thousand, we filtered it down to a hundred. That's what screening is. And then we do diagnostic work to figure it out from 100 down to 10. And then when we do those 10, we're very much hoping that we did our job right and we found those three original cancers are still now in this 10. We do biopsies on those 10 and we find 30% of our 
biopsies show cancer. That's the effective kind of filtering philosophy behind population-based uh, screening. Of course, do we always catch all the cancers from the thousand all the way through the other side? Unfortunately, we don't, but we catch enough of it that we try to save lives. Now, I'm trying to make arguments, and I'm kind of arguing without having a person here in front of me to argue with these mammal skeptics. And I would want to just tell you what I'm trying to base it on. It's not based on my feelings. It's not based on a religion or something like that. Or if you want to say, what's my religion? It's evidence-based medicine. I'm going to try to share with you why I think the evidence is very strong that uh, doing screening mammography in a population saves a lot of lives. The classic way to prove that is going to be with randomized controlled trials. I'm going to spend a few minutes looking at the seven large-scale randomized controlled trials that have been done with uh, screening mammography. But there are other trials that are non-randomized, and they also give us an insight into what's going on. Um, one of the key things is when we do screening, you should never look to see if your test, in this case, mammography, uh, just catches, finds cancers. Because a, a lot of different modalities can catch a cancer. A lot of different modalities can catch a, a breast cancer. What we're not looking to see is if it finds disease. We're trying to find if it saves lives. So we're not really looking to see if something made a diagnosis. We're looking to see if that population is living longer with less uh, death caused by breast cancer superimposed on its otherwise normal uh, actuarial experience. Now, you're often going to hear in the discussion on screening mammography about surrogate markers. And that's if you haven't measured the death, then you can use surrogates, meaning you can use a substitute, which is maybe easier to obtain than the figure out if there's a lower death rate. And those kind of give us a hint whether something is working or not, but they are not as good as the true goal. Keep the true goal in your mind, which is the death rate, not trying to find cancers, but to lower the death rate. And another thing you have to realize is that I like to say this in a slightly provocative way, screening is medical communism. And what the hell do I mean by that? What I mean is this, most cases, as a doctor and as a radiologist or even internal medicine or anything, what you're, you're, you're patient-centered, you're supposed to be patient-centered. If I'm reading a, a plain film of somebody who hurt their leg, I'm looking to see if they broke their femur. Uh, I don't really care uh, if uh, somebody else had broke their femur or not. I'm trying to read the x-ray of that one particular person. I'm trying to get that one right. So my focus is helping that one person. But in screening, we can't just focus on the one person. You know what's really uh, our patient, when a screening point of view, is a population. We are saying the women of Columbia or the women of New York City are at risk for this disease, and are we lowering the overall risk of death in that population? Some, obviously, if we, if, we, if we are doing a good job, we're saving some individual lives, but, there, but there's also some harms that we're doing. We're scaring people, and we, we may make a false uh, diagnosis of cancer when there isn't. Uh, there's all kinds of potential downsides to it, but what, when, we're, when the population is at risk, at least you know your goal is an overall uh, sense of improvement, not really focused on an individual person because we, we can't do that and screen a population. See, there's a big round population of, of people who potentially have a disease, but there's a little, little group in there which have that hidden disease in there and we're trying to, trying to find it. So our, our patient is not the little question mark. Our patient is the whole population that we're subjecting to this filtering process of screening. What are the risks associated with breast cancer? Well, there's a million. There's, uh, there's fairly powerful ones. First of all, if you're female, you have 100 times greater chance of getting breast cancer than a male, even though males have the same number of breasts as women. Most women have two breasts. Most men have two breasts. Uh, so it's not by the number, but being female increases your probability of breast cancer by about 100. Uh, age, being the leprous, having uh, BRCA mutations, uh, PAL-B2 mutations, these are all fairly strongly associated with increased risk for breast cancer. And then there's other risk factors, a little less strong, like obesity, uh, alcohol abuse, 
radiation, actually that can be a strong one if you get a lot of radiation, but a little bit of radiation might be, have a low level of uh, thing and of, of, of inducing cancers. Age of manarchy, estrogen, and actually there's many, many more factors. So wouldn't it be nice if we could say, we don't need to screen the entire female population of a city or a state or a country. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just say, let's only screen the women who have BRCA genes, or let's screen only screen the women who are nulliparous, who have some risk factor. Big problem with doing that, we'd miss most of the cancers because most breast cancer is not related to any of these known risks. We have a certain technical term for that, and that's that breast cancers in general are, are most commonly sporadic, which means they appear with no real family history or uh, known mutation or anything uh, other than being female and of a certain age. So for sporadic, not familial, that's why we're stuck. If we're going to do screening mammography, basically we're stuck with doing an entire population, like all the women over age 40 or age 50 in a given population. So it isn't for want of trying, not trying that we could get it focused. Maybe someday we'll figure out how to focus it more. So here's a, a, a little warning that somebody put on the, um, on, the, on the street, painted on the street to explain there's a school nearby. And apparently the painter didn't go to school because <laughs> didn't learn how to spell the word <laughs> school. And uh, so maybe they should have gone down the block a little bit and en enrolled in that school. And, you know, sometimes messages are confusing and uh, sometimes the mammo skeptics um, uh, say things that sound very plausible as I even started the lecture with. And you have to be a little bit careful and a little skeptical and uh, try to figure out if that's right or not. I, I like to collect signs that I think are ridiculous. This is another one from uh, England. Touching the wires causes instant death, but after you're dead, they're going to fine you $200. Uh, seems to me that's a pretty minimal monetary penalty after you're uh, being fried on those, um, on those hot wires. Um, so uh, so the, it's the same thing with, with this whole field of breast imaging and the controversies around screening mammography. I'm trying to be as honest. I'll show you all the data pro and con as best as I can without trying to filter them, but that's not what is present in a lot of these presentations that are anti. So screening, it's kind of like when you were screening at the airport, right? You're looking for a, a bomb and like the screening at the airport, you know, they might screen hundred million people before they find one particular bad actor, some terrorist or something that wants to blow up the pain. Maybe you have to screen a thousand people, uh, I mean, a billion people. So it's a very, very low prevalence of things they're finding, which makes their job really, really hard and almost impossible. Let me frame this one other way, which is it's really when we're doing with populations, we're really dealing with statistics. So let me show you one statistical uh, principle here that uh, is very important to understand because of its implication on how it affects screening. And that's a famous population, uh, 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 a, um, a um, famous um, theorem of uh, probability, uh, Bayes' theorem. He was uh, developed by a uh, uh, a, 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 a priest, a, a minister uh, in, um, in England, I think it was in England, uh, and he developed this equation that was really, really at the heart of figuring out how probabilities can be calculated, like the probability of getting a cancer if you have a test. So it's really saying if you have a test that's positive, what's the real chance that you really do have that disease, given that the test is positive? You have a PPD, what's the chance of having real TB? when your PPD is positive. They use this kind of calculation. So let's, let's use it in a real test. Let's say you're at a breast center and you suspect that your technologists are sneaking into the women's room and smoking pot. So there they are smoking away there. So you wanna catch them. So, you, so you, you buy a breathalyzer test, which can help detect if they have smoked pot recently. By the way, my texts don't. I'm just using this as an example. <laughs> so let's say you have a breathalyzer test and it's a really good breathalyzer. It's 90% sensitive and 80% specific. Most x-ray tests, most medical tests are not as good as those two numbers I just cited. 90% sensitive, 80% specific. And let's assume that in this group of my, of my texts, that 5% of them are taking the marijuana. So if there's uh, if there's 20 texts, one of them is taking the, uh, the marijuana secretly. 
So if you use Bayes' theorem, I'm going to plug in, you have all the numbers you need to, to calculate that. And there's the top of that uh, fraction, and here's the bottom of the fraction. And if you multiply it out and do the math, what you find is if the breathalyzer is positive, how often is that person really smoking as opposed to a false alarm? And if you do that math, what you're going to find is even a test that's 90% sensitive and 80% specific, only 19% of the positive breathalyzers will actually be a true ca cannabis smoker. So it's, it sounded like a great test, but this is turning out to be not a great test. And you know why? It's poisoned by the fact that the prevalence is low. The only 5% of the population uh, was smoking. That was my, my, uh, my given going into this equation. So therefore, since it's low, it means there's going to be a lot of false positives. And that's why the take home for doing in a, a mammographic screening is that the incidence of a disease and actually the prevalence must be high or no matter what test you use, ultrasound, MRI, uh, mammograms, it'll all be pretty lousy. So that's why, why is mammography and breast care and so one of the few that screening works? It's because, as I said, the prevalence of breast cancer is actually probably the highest of any cancer. So it, it lets us, it gets us at least into the ballpark where it, it's, it's possible, possible to do it. So here's my little common um, thing to figure out. If you're going to screen for a disease, it's got to have certain features. First of all, it has to be a common disease, like I said, because you can't screen for rare things. And it really has to be a very, very serious disease, in most cases, a deadly disease, or at least deadly to some, some of the patients. Why is that? You're not going to screen and do all the work of screening to help to find a common colds or acne. Uh, it's not worth all the work. You're going to do a lot of work. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of effort. So you want it to pay off for something really important like life or death. So survival should be the goal of screening. And if it's survival, you got to start with a common and deadly disease. And it's got to be a disease that does this, this following little cascade of its, of its life history. There are some people who don't have the disease. They're healthy. But what we're going to say is we need to have a disease that has an early phase. And that early phase is before any symptoms occur. Because if we, just, we could just wait for the symptoms. If we just waited for breast cancer till a lump to show up, that's what we used to do in, before 1980s in the, when screening started in the U.S. So we... Uh, we just waited for lumps to show up and then we worked them up. But what we're saying is with mammography, we're finding breast cancers that are in an early phase that are completely asymptomatic, but they're cooking along, growing in that breast. A lot of diseases don't have much of an early phase like that. And then, of course, once symptoms occur, it, that disease can get more and more advanced until it finally leads to death. So the whole idea is we're trying to find it before the symptoms in that early phase. And hopefully that's going to affect uh, the, um, the uh, outcome, the survival of that disease. Uh, that screening test has to be cheap because if, it's, if it costs a million dollars, how are you going to screen millions and millions of people? And it has to have a good ROC. What do I mean by that? A good sensitivity, a good specificity. Almost no test has a perfect sensitivity uh, and or a perfect specificity, but it has to be up there in order to be considered. Good. And then if so, if you do that screening test for this disease, if it's negative and the sensitivity is pretty good, you can tell that person just uh, you're good. Come back next year or whatever the interval is. But if the screening test is positive, it does not tell you they have the disease. It tells you that you need extra tests to see if you have, have the disease. So this is the equivalent of going from a thousand to a hundred. Then you do more and more tests. You do in the breast case, you're doing diagnostic mammography and spot compressions and tomography and ultrasound and other things. And then you're narrowing it down to the 10 and then you do biopsies. And when you do the biopsies, you find early cancers and you're treating them years earlier than if you had waited for the symptoms to occur. By the way, breast cancer, we get about two year head start before symptoms would have occurred. And that is what's going to lead to hip, hip, hooray, fewer deaths. This is the way a screening test is designed to work you find the negatives and you send them home. You find the positives, doesn't mean you have it, but you do extra tests and you find the subset of them that actually have the disease. And if you treat that disease earlier, 
if it's going to be a good screening test, it has to lead to fewer deaths. Let's look at a success story. Cervical cancer. Used to be a common killer in the US. It's not a common killer anymore. Why? Because there's a really good screening test for it, pap smears. It's cheap. It has a good ROC, meaning it has good sensitivity. It has good specificity. When a pap smear is negative, that woman can safely go away and come back the next, for her next pap smear next year or two. But if the pap smear is positive, it does not mean she has cervical cancer. It means there's some abnormality in the cervix. Some of those, those will go for additional tests like cone biopsies or coposcopy. And then we'll find some cervical cancers and we'll find some CIS, some carcinoma in situ, early, early, early disease, all of which can be treated much easier than, uh, than later stage cervical cancer. And guess what? We're now seeing significantly fewer deaths from cervical cancer. This is the success story. This is the one that people would like to clone up if we can. So let me talk about ultrasound screening, taking a step back from just breast, but just ultrasound screening in general. What if we could find a common killer cancer of the US and just do ultrasound if, with no ionizing radiation, it's inexpensive, and it can catch early and treatable cancers. That's true. And what, what situation am I talking about? How about ovarian cancer? Uh, ovarian cancer, you can pick up ovarian cancer by doing uh, pelvic ultrasound, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it actually finds lesions pretty easily and pretty accurately, which is great. Do we do ovarian cancer screening? We absolutely do not. And, and I speak as one who tried. I, I was in a ovarian cancer screening uh, research project for five years. And uh, the bottom line was, did we save lives? No. And by the way, we can see renal carcinomas on ultrasound. Do we screen the population for renal cancer? No. Do we screen the patients for pancreatic or bladder cancers? All seen on ultrasound, but we know we don't. And in fact, ovarian, if you look at the official reviews of, of screening tests, they'll say that uh, whether you're using CA-125 or transvaginal ultrasound or a regular pelvic exam, the bottom line is none of them, none of the screenings work because it leads to so many false positives that then need laparoscopies or laparotomies, either surgery or scoping people to go and then finding, you know, functional cysts in most cases. So ovarian cancer, so many other cancers, screening is not going to work. Here's the problem. Ovarian cancer, as I said, we do ultrasound screening. The sensitivity is good, but the specificity stinks. So if it's negative, that's good. You're probably okay. But when it's positive, the problem is it would lead to a ton more tests. So many more tests that we just can't really do millions of surgeries to find a couple ovarian cancers. So the benefit of screening in this case is blocked between doing the screening and doing the definitive tests that would help figure out which of those individuals. So you never get to fewer deaths when we do ovarian cancer screening using ultrasound or even um, a chemical, chemical detection. Let's look at prostate cancer for us guys. There's a PSA test, which uh, has a pretty good sensitivity, a pretty good specificity. If the PSA is negative, you know, we, we can pretty much uh, safely say, okay, see you next year, doctor. But if it's positive, there are false positives. So you need extra tests. You need to have different uh, prostate uh, radiologic exams and biopsies. And what you do find is you do find some cancers, uh, some false alarms and some cancers. And then the cancers you can treat earlier. Isn't that good? Yeah, it's good, except for one problem. It's never been shown that, that earlier treatment for prostate actually saves fewer deaths. Um, it hasn't been disproved either. It's kind of an unknown, but it's certainly not a dramatic saving in deaths because there have been a number of trials that did earlier treatment for prostate cancers and found basically the death rates were kind of unchanged uh, uh, following uh, this kind of treatment. So, uh, so for instance, for myself, I know that I'm a big advocate of screening mammography, but I'm not a huge advocate of PSA. I myself don't even get one because uh, it doesn't seem to do the thing that a screening test is supposed to do, which is lower the death rate. Uh, it does find pr prostate cancers. Apparently some of them are indolent, grow slowly and uh, a person could die, a guy could die at age 95 
with that little cancer sitting there not doing anything. So I've developed a little test to see if I could figure out how to figure out if a test could be a good screening test. And what I've described is nine different things that I think are important for a screening test to be in order to make it useful. You have to have a high enough incidence like I've described. It has to be sensitive and specific and comfortable and quick, cheap, reproducible, available, and it saves lives. You have better clinical outcomes from it. And what I did is I assigned weights. All of these things are not equally important. So what I said is there are several of these that are absolutely critical. If, they, if you don't have them, you're not gonna do the screening test. And that's, it's gotta have a high enough incidence or any screening test is doomed and it's got to save lives. It's got to have a better outcome by getting through the end of that process. So those get a very high weight. And then there are some that are important, and I gave intermediate weights to things like the sensitivity and specificity, and that it's cheap. And then there's some useful ones that are they're very good, and they're important, but they're not as important as some of the others, like that the test is comfortable uh, uh, and um, quick and reproducible. So if you use this little chart, you can plug in a screening test and you can see how good a screening test compared to other screening tests. So remember the PSA? This is my scoring for a PSA. For instance, the incidence is lower than something like breast cancer. So I gave that a four and there's never been shown to have better outcomes. So I only gave at the far end there a two for better outcomes. And you multiply it by those weights I described, you get weighted scores and when you total it up, Overall, PSA for prostate cancer gets a score of around 340, which is pretty good, but as you'll see, not as good as things like mammography. How about the pap smear? Look at that. See, that has a much higher weight. Told you that's a kind of a, a, um, a, a, this is the poster child for a good screening test. And it got a good score of 423 compared to the 340 or so for the, um, for the for the for the prior test how about ovarian cancer screening again if you plug in the how what the incidence of the disease is how sensitive and specific it is you plug that in you get an even lower score which is why almost everybody recommends against trying to look at a general population for ovarian cancer using ultrasound for instance so but we want to find breast cancer what modalities can find a breast cancer Guess what? Just about every modality you can think of. MRIs, ultrasound, clinical breast exams, self-breast exams. And by the way, clinical breast exams and self-breast exams are really good things, but they've been, they've been put through many, many trials. Not a single one ever showed that there were lives saved by the cancers they detected. So that's why it's a good, they're good things and they're easy things and they're, they cost nothing and they, uh, and they, they do, they, there's some good in a sense that they do, but they don't do the ultimate good, which is to save lives as far as we can tell. How about nuclear medicine studies, Sestamibi, Dr. Lavage, uh, PET scanning, all those can find cancers. The one, the workhorse here, mammography is the one I'm talking about. Tomography as a subset of that and breast, there are breast dedicated breast CT units that can be used. All of them find breast cancer. And then there's the more fringe uh, uh, modalities. Uh, who knows, maybe in the future, they'll be uh, worked out to be better. Thermography, electrical impedance, transmission la laser. And, uh, and then there's, uh, there's, there's uh, another thing, you know, we have CAT scan, the breast CAT scan, and we have a PET scan. So wouldn't it be nice if we had dog scanning? And we do have for breast, we do have dog scanning. I, I have a, I have a, 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 a yellow Labrador that uh, seems to uh, do a good job of but he can, he, what he does screening for is for dog treats. <laughs> but you can train a dog, according to some people in the medical literature, to sniff the urine of women and to be able to detect the metabolites of a breast cancer. And they'll like bark if there's breast cancer in that uh, patient whose uh, urine they gave and they won't bark otherwise. And then you, you reward them with a stick or something like that. Uh, I'm not uh, saying it doesn't work. Uh, I'm a little skeptical that it might be of clinical utility. But any of you out there have good experience with dog scanning, let me know. That was my joke slide. I, I hate giving joke slides and not being able to see people laugh. It's one of the problems with virtual here. So let's look at breast cancer. If we're gonna to try to do screening mammography, so mammo's there as the screening test. It is cheap. It, does, it has a good sensitivity and specificity. 
So if it's negative, yeah, a woman can just say, see you next year. But if it's positive, doesn't mean you got breast cancer, but you're now in the hundred out of the thousand that need extra tests. You need extra mammo tests, maybe an ultrasound, maybe other tests. You may need a biopsy eventually. And what you do is you wind up with uh, diagnosing some breast cancers before the symptoms appear. And when you do that and you treat them, guess what? You really get fewer deaths. So this one, like cervical cancer screening, gets to the end zone, the uh, makes a, make, scores the, the score we want, which is the fewer deaths, not just finding the diseases, but fewer deaths. And it's going to show you statistics that uh, we're talking about maybe 30 to 50% fewer deaths. Of course, that means a lot of women are going to do everything right, get the screening mammogram, and uh, they get diagnosed and everything else. And they're part of the remainder from that 30 to 50% and they still die. So it currently seems like mammography is not certainly working on everybody. It's working on maybe a third up to maybe a half of the lives that are saved. And of course, one of the, one of the ways it's not working perfectly is when a mammogram says it's negative, it's actually wrong in about 15% of cases or so. So what if I plug into my little chart here for MAMO uh, for cancer screening, and if you calculate the numbers there, you find a score of 448, which is actually ballpark around the same as cervical cancer screening, the one that works strongly. So I think from this point of view, uh, you know, if you take for granted my, my little spreadsheet of decision making, which is certainly open to adjustments and to uh, different people might have different opinions on how to score things, but uh, but in, but I think it's, I'm trying to do a reasonable approximation here and breast cancer seems to do better than a lot of the screening tests and equally well as cervical screening. So let's look at what happened in history. This is the United States population, the, 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 the deaths that were caused in the United States from 1930 up to the 2000s in women, women who died from cancers. And what you can see is a number of the cancers have a straight line from left to right, meaning they're killing roughly the same number of women in 1930, and it's about the same now, like for instance, ovary. There's some like stomach cancer started out very high in 1930, has continuously gone down through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and we don't really know why. We haven't done anything specifically to cause a reduction that we know of uh, that cause a reduction in stomach cancers. And yet the stomach cancers have been diving for quite a while and continue to dive. The, the, the assumption is that better food preservation, better food preparation uh, has, uh, has has played some role in uh, reducing stomach cancers. And if you look at the dark blue line near the top, that's breast cancer. And that was the deaths in the United States from breast cancer was absolutely stable. It was a stable as a, one of those horizontal lines. It was until around 1980, and that's when screening mammography started. And then look what happened. It dived after screening mammography started. Uh, and why did it dive? We think because of screening mammography, but not only because of screening mammography. In this period of time, there's better chemotherapy agents that have been developed. There's better surgery. There's better radiation therapy uh, uh, routines that are being done. So there's other factors that may be lowering the death rate. But if you ask them of that 30% mortality in the death rate, if you ask the radiation oncologists who give the radiation or the surgical oncologists who do the surgery or the medical oncologists who give that improved chemotherapy, they will tell you, yes, a little of this drop is due to us, but that two thirds of that reduction is due to the early mammographic screening that we're giving patients to them to treat in earlier stages and earlier grades, and that leads to greater survivals. And by the way, we're getting this reduction, even though in the United States, only about half the women who are asked to come for a screening mammogram actually show up. So imagine if you're seeing if a drug worked and only half the person, people, uh, uh, the people in the trial, only half of them took the drug. Obviously, you wouldn't be seeing as much life-saving benefit of, of a drug that worked. So here's the kind of the key trial of this, of the key slide of this whole of this whole um, uh, presentation, and that's there are seven randomized trials that have looked at hundreds of thousands of women. If you put all these trials together, it actually is 
a, a total of uh, of a million and a half a million and a half women that were placed in trials, half of whom got a mammogram, half of them didn't get a mammogram, randomly selected, and then they just went to see how many died from breast cancer. And of those trials, many, many of them showed how mammography saves lives. 1963, way back then with lousy mammography, the hospital insurance plan, that's the HIP plan of New York, I'm proud to say my, my home state here, they did a study in which they found 30% lower deaths, 29% to be exact, uh, lowered deaths from the women who got the same treatments from the same populations. Only difference is one group got a mammogram, one group a screening mammogram, one group didn't. So it lowered the death rate by almost 30%. In Sweden, they did a similar study, slightly better mammography. It's kind of a better trial in, in general. And they found it higher uh, reduction in the death rate. In this case, it's to 32% lowered death rate. In the Malmö, Sweden, they did another trial. Look at that. Uh, that got 20%. In Stockholm, 20%. In the Gothenburg trial, there they got, they were approaching 50% lower death rates from women who got mammograms, everything else being the same. In Edinburgh, Scotland also showed a, a good life-saving benefit of, a, of a 21%. And then the final trial, which is the one that the mammal deniers always refer to, the mammal deniers, the mammal skeptics are, um, are uh, focusing on, and that's in the Canada trial, a big trial in Canada, had a lot of good, strong features in it, but in our opinion was flawed. And you can see, not only did they say mammography didn't work, they're saying that more women died who got a mammogram, everything being equal, than the women who didn't get. And their explanation was, is that the couple of milli, 100 millirads that the mammogram get must have induced more breast cancers, which is uh, essentially inconceivable based on uh, uh, our understanding of how much radiation it takes to induce uh, a sizable number of uh, breast cancers in a population. So I'm gonna show you that, that that number, it's an outlier when it comes to these seven studies, six show a lot of life saving, one doesn't. And I'm gonna show you why we think that was an outlier. But before that, look at there are case control studies. Case control studies are probably not the gold standard that randomized studies are, but they are good at estimating the actual number, the actual numerical quantity of the benefit. And when you look at them, the Nimijin uh, had a 50% lower death rate. Utrecht had a 70% lower death rate just from getting a mammogram versus not. And the same thing, almost 70% in Florence, Italy. So this is really reinforcing that uh, it seems that mammography is saving a lot of lives, not all, but a lot of lives. And then there's random, non-randomized centers that just looked at historical controls, and both of them also show a lot of life-saving benefit from, from screening mammography. Here's the screening uh, outcomes from one of those studies. This is the two-county trial in Sweden. If you look at the two lines on the top there, one line were the controls that didn't get a mammogram, and label control and the one below that study that was women who got the same chemo the same surgery living in the same places same everything's except they got a mammogram and look at that they had a 30 percent less of a death rate than uh, than the than the controls in fact the study was ended because it was considered unethical to have a um have a control arm that's dying so much more than a um uh, than a study arm so it was considered unethical not to give mammograms to everybody 11 large trials, 10 showed a lot of saving reduction. The only exception was that Canada one study. And that's the one, as I say, that the, uh, the mammal skeptics say, well, the Canada study showed it really didn't work. Well, we think it's the Canada study that didn't work. I'm gonna show you about its randomization. But even if you include uh, the Canada study, you still get a 30% reduction in um, the death. And yet, a famous uh, study that was that is also used by the um, mammo skeptics is called the Cochrane study. And what they estimate is that, yes, breast cancer is lowered with mammography, but only about 15%. And you might say, well, if even if you use all the seven good randomized studies, you get 30% as a meta-analysis. How did they get 15%? Well, I'll show you how they did it. They took these seven and they said the randomization was bad in five of them and good in two of them. 
we disagree with that, but using their logic, what they did is let's throw that one out and let's throw that one out and throw that one out throw that one out and throw that one out. So what are they left with? The Canada study, which said it was dangerous to get a mammogram and the Malmo study, which had the least benefit of actually any of the other studies. So in my opinion, this is kind of a cookbooks scenario where you're just selectively picking studies that you like to get the result that you want rather than looking at the overall thing or looking to see which one is really the outlier here. And why might it be an outlier? We think it's because of the randomization. What happened is in Canada, they had an enrollment form like this. The first woman that came, she was a subject. She got a mammogram. The next woman, she would sign her name below it, and that would be listed as a control. Didn't get a mammogram. The next one below that was a mammogram. Next one below that, not. So the person signing her up knew whether they were getting a mammogram or not. It's not blinded. And you know what they did? They did a clinical breast exam right before this selection. And so if a woman came in and she had a lump in her breast, which is a suspicious thing, we suspect that they put those women out of the kindness of their hearts to make sure they got the mammogram on the subject line. Maybe they jumped the line and put it on the subject line so that uh, more women with worrisome clinical features were put to get the mammogram and the controls that didn't get the mammogram didn't have any worrisome clinical features. Why do we think that, you know, that's kind of a, thing to accuse these these people running this study that they kind of screwed it up but the the way we can kind of reinforce that thought is when you look at the women who were controls and who were the subjects and just look at they should have the same diseases if it was randomized you'd expect the same cancers uh, with the same amount of positive nodes for instance to be in the subjects and controls but you can see there are many more positive nodes in, these, in the women who were sent to the mammogram than the women with the controls. And in fact, women who had lots of nodes, which is when you're really discussing high risk of death from um, a locally advanced breast cancer, look at this, almost four times more of those kinds of horrible cancers showing up, not randomized, but on the subjects that getting the mammo side rather than the controls. And that was true overall. What are the arguments again? Widespread screening. I'm going to tell you overdiagnosis. I'm going to discuss that in a minute. The survival benefit is due to improved treatments. Well, the people doing those improved treatments, they tell us that yes, that they have done a better job, like those chemotherapy improvements and surgical improvements. But even they will tell, say that it's this screening that's done the most of the life-saving benefit. And then there are there are people who say that. We're, all that we're seeing when we screen is a lead time bias, which means when we do a screening test and we catch a disease early, it seems like they live longer just because we found the disease earlier. But in reality, if they, women might still die of their breast cancer at the same time, they would have anyway, but it seems like an extra year or two because we caught it a year or two earlier. That is absolutely impossible the way this, uh, our, those seven screening trials were set up because they didn't look at when the cancer was diagnosed, they looked at just whether women died or not. So there was no uh, measurement of the time that the cancer was known. That's not what the, that was not the end point they were looking at. It's the time of death, when the death occurred and the deaths occurred less in the screening group. And then minimal benefit, I showed you how I, in my opinion, those books were cooked a little bit. I think the benefit should be 30 to 50%, not the 15%. And then you have to compare that benefit to the harms. When we do a screening test, there really are harms. It, it can cause pain. It scares the uh, living, uh, uh, you know what, out of somebody to be told you might have a, a, a deadly disease. It costs a fair amount of money to do the screening, to do the extra biopsies and extra diagnostic tests. So there are harms. But how do you balance that? That is not a medical question. This is a question in the population in our societies, in our uh, to look at how much benefit are we getting, how many lives are we saving, and how much are we driving people crazy with extra tests? It's a realistic balance, but it's not one that there's a medical uh, answer to. It's it's what people are willing to undergo with what kind of anxieties they do. Now, overdiagnosis is when we find a cancer, but that cancer never would have killed anybody. We know that happens with prostate cancer. And look at this, the, if you see the blue triangles there, that's the incidence of prostate cancer. 
And if you notice right around 1990, it shot way up. You know why? People started using PSAs, the prostate specific antigen, and they found lots of extra cancers using the PSA. But notice what happened is that there's a big bump when that happened. And that's because you caught extra disease. Whereas if you look at breast cancer, that, that doesn't have a big bump like that, even though around that same time, well, actually in the late 80s, there was uh, the, the beginning of screening for breast cancer. And if we were doing an overdiagnosis, you would have expected a similar bump like that. Same thing when you look at just the incidence before and after screening mammography, the numbers go up slightly, but you don't really see a, a bump like we do in, in prostate. There's no real evidence of, of overdiagnosis. And then remember I said, couldn't it be just be due to the fact that we're, we're saving more lives because the chemo is better or the surgery is better? Well, we have a built-in control group, men. We don't screen for breast cancer in men. We wait till lumps appear or breast discharge or uh, an ulcer, skin ulceration or skin dumpling. So we wait for symptoms in men. And in women, we're trying to find the cancers earlier with screening. So let's look at what happened from 1970, which is when before any screening mammography occurred. And if you chart how we improved survival, that's this improvement in survival in the United States for breast cancer and for women. And you can see it continuously improved. And in men, there was also an, a, a serial improvement, but it was less so. So that the fact that this curve gets up somewhat means the men are benefiting from better chemo and better surgery. But the difference in those two curves is actually the benefit we can then peel out. The only thing different between them is they're men and women, and there's also that one got screening and one didn't. So we of that benefit, as I said, it's roughly about two thirds of it is uh, caused by the screening. If you look at advanced breast cancers, look at all those trials. Almost all of them show significantly less advanced disease. The one exception is the Canada study. So which is the outlier here? In my opinion, it's not that the Canada is the reliable one and all the others that were done in different ways are wrong in some way. It's that Canada, I think, is the outlier. We love the country of Canada. I, I love it to death, but uh, their Canada one trial, in my opinion, is flawed. And this is one way to show that it's a complete lie outlier. If you graph it a different way, look at this for locally advanced diseases. All the other trials roughly are on this curve. And Canada's on the curve too, but look at it's way, way as an outlier uh, off there in, um, in right field. So I told you at the beginning, there were these all these statements that are true, but they're misleading. Let's go through them one by one. 40,000 women died of breast cancer in the US. After screening mammography, now in 2013, 40,000 died. That's true, but what it doesn't take into account the population of the US increased a lot in that time. In the 1980, there was 226 million. In 2013, 360 million. So if you look at the, at the mortality per woman, in other words, per capita, it dropped from 71 to 51 out of 100,000, which is the dec decline in mortality that we predict from screening mammography. How about only one in, woman in 1,000 will have their life saved by mammography. This is true. In fact, this is even an understatement, but it's still not really particularly relevant. Let's do a back of the envelope calculation. There's about 80 million women in the United States, adult women, 50% of them show up. So about 40 million women every year come for their mammogram. We estimate screening mammography saves about 15,000 lives. So if you do the math, only one woman out of actually 2,600 have their life saved mammography. That's true, but it also winds up in a country of 15,000 lives saved. So even though that sounds like a small fraction, it's not, it's not infinitesimally small and it adds up to tens of thousands of lives. Let me compare it to seatbelts. And seatbelts also save about 15,000 lives. We estimated the US um, Traffic Bureau estimated in 2017. Um, uh, and there's about 3 trillion miles driven every year in the United States. If you estimate the average trip between, there's some trips that are two miles and some trips that are 200 miles, average is around 20 miles per trip, which means every year in the United States is about 150 billion trips. And so that means every time you go on a trip, if you count that as a seatbelt click, that means it takes 10 million seatbelt clicks 
to save one life by a seatbelt, but we don't say that's a reason not to do seatbelts. Mammography has not prevented a single case of breast cancer, but its radiation has probably induced some. Mammography doesn't prevent any cancers. It's not like a vaccine or something like that. It prevents some breast cancer deaths. We think it prevents about 30 to 50% breast cancer deaths. Yes, breast cancer in, produces breast, uh, breast radiation from the cancer, from the mammography can, kills some women because it produces some cancers. But we estimate there's about 100 lives saved for each induced cancer. Or another way of saying it is it's 400 lives saved for each induced cancer death. Um, so there's a net 399 lives saved, even counting in the cancers that were caused by the mammography. What are the optimal guidelines? The real, the real the decision nowadays is whether you should customize a guideline for screening mammography or whether it should be just a simple guideline for population. It'd be nice that you can use, we could use the risk of breast cancer from BRCAs and family history radiation, and breast, there's a lot of factors that could go into it, but no consensus formula has emerged yet. I think in the future, there will be a formula that'll say whether or not we should screen or not. Right now, what the it recommending in the US uh, and country, countries that have a similar um, medical uh, establishment and also have a similar prevalence of breast cancer is that women should have a risk assessment by age 30, screening mammography in general at age 40, unless you're at very high risk and that keep screening them. Uh, and how do we use to read a screening mammogram? We use the BIRAD system, which is an amazing, uh, beautiful uh, system that was developed this was developed in consultation from all the players, meaning breast surgeons, breast oncologists, radiation oncologists, and breast imagers got together and they said, let's all speak the same language. So they agreed on a set of terminology and how to do screening and how to report screening so that they understand what's going on. And that's been updated 1988 uh, up to the 2003. Uh, and it's, it's, this is available all around the world. Here's a nice uh, example of a, a BIRED booklet. So you can see this has now been uh, used in Spanish speaking countries. I got this one from the country of Uruguay. I, if there's any Uruguayans down there, hi there, love your country, lived there for a little while and helped set up breast cancer screening centers there. And, uh, and uh, this was the uh, BIRED's book that was being promulgated on there and there's, it's in Chinese and in uh, I forget how many different languages this is available and is the basis for us speaking the same language across the way there. This is the most common, uh, this is the most uh, recent update of the of that BIREDS Atlas. And just wanna say, if you wanna know what we're recommending now in the United States with our prevalence and with our system of, um, of uh, coverage, um, we're saying that high risk women can actually start the mammography screening early and get MRI screening in addition to it. Uh, intermediate women recommend mammo, mammo screening, maybe an MRI, maybe an ultrasound, but mammo is the, the kingpin. And then for the, for the, for the uh, average risk woman with no known risk factors where we're looking for the sporadic breast cancers, that's uh, usually just mammography. Ultrasound may be appropriate. I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest with you. Well, I hope it didn't run over too long. Here's my conclusion. Screening is not diagnosis. Finding a diagnosis of breast cancer is relatively easy. Screening a population appropriately, so you're filtering it down and finding the people who have preclinical disease, that is a challenge, but it's got a payoff. The patient is your population. It's not actually individual. An individual woman who comes for screening, she may wind up with a biopsy and it comes back benign. And she went all through that with no benefit to her. It actually hurt her, right? She had to undergo needles and uh, anxiety and everything else. But the population benefits when there's a whole bunch of women who were alive that would have been dead in their graves had they not got that screening. So screening mammography saves a lot of lives. Don't listen to those mammo deniers. Look at the evidence, look at the evidence I showed you, look at it skeptically yourself. Is it 30%? Is it 50%? There's arguments that can be made for both of those figures or anything in between. But it's not the 15% that the Cochrane Report has me mentioned, as I said, from what I call as cooking their books. And BIREDS is our common language around the world. And uh, I'd love to speak it with you. I hope this lecture was of help. 
and uh, be glad to answer any questions or have any comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, so I will open up the floors to everyone. If there's any questions, go ahead and type in the question into the chat. Um, I do see one question from uh, Carolina Rabin. Uh, she asks, what is your opinion about performing a screening program based on DBT and synthetic MX? <laughs> I, I would love to answer that question if I knew what synthetic MX was. So uh, could uh, Dr. Rabin, could you teach that to me and, and I'll see if I can uh, figure out an answer. <laughs> it's, it's probably a, a name of something that I know, but maybe it's a uh, specific name in a certain country or in a from a certain manufacturer. How about uh, when, well, if I'm waiting for other questions? Uh, oh, and thank you. A synthetic mammogram from the DBT image. There you go. Got it. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, um, the the, uh, I, the the opinions that I was giving you about screening mammography in general in this talk are really referring to, in my opinion, the optimal way is with a digital breast tomosynthesis as opposed to the 2D mammograms, you get a better result if you can, if you have Telmo and you're, it's available to you. And then the synthetic image is uh, reliable. It is, um, it is convenient. It, by using it, you lower the X, the dose to the breast by half. So remember I told you the, the amount of radiation um, that we give in a mammogram that could cause a cancer is very low. But if you use, Synthetic MX, you will uh, lower it by half again because the dose is half that of, uh, of, of, of that. So yes, I'm a big fan of DBT, but if you don't have DBT and you have just 2D mammography, that's actually all those uh, um, uh, uh, blinded uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 trials were done using 2D mammography. So you still get a lot of life-saving benefit. I think you get a little bit more with Tomo. Any other questions, concerns, comments? And you know, for those of my my uh, my international friends, uh, just to, to state, you know, this doesn't uh, this is not a cookie cutter that needs to be applied in other populations, uh, you know, without thought. In other words, is breast cancer that breast cancer varies in incidence and prevalence at different countries. So uh, if it's high in your country, it's a reasonable thing to think about. Uh, you know, if you're also a health system can afford it and your country can afford it. Uh, it but if you're in a country with a low incidence of breast cancer, uh, you know, it probably uh, needs to be thought with some crit critical thinking about, uh, are you getting enough benefit for what the resources you're putting to it? So I love screening mammography, but doesn't mean I want to ram it down everybody's throat. It's, but it's helpful if you're if you're if your region, if your country, if your ethnic group has uh, a scourge of a lot of breast cancer. That's when it can uh, really benefit the most. All right, I think that okay. is it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope everyone enjoyed the rest of their day. Yes, thank you so much. On behalf of Health for the World, uh, we would like to thank our speaker, moderator, and attendees for joining today. Uh, we will see the rest of you next week. Thank you so much.